everybody. It is the uh, Figure Four Daily Show with myself and Lance Storm. And we got a lot to talk about here today because I think last week, if I can uh, do all of this here, we got to do things a little bit differently because uh, Lance's box is all busted up. But uh, if I recall last week, Lance, we weren't here on the air. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, everything went down. Everything went down again today as well. But we're here, actually. <laughs> I have not solved my my other problem that was besieging me during uh, during Observer Live. Someday maybe I'll tell the story about how much I hate a certain company. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Oh, it's a good one. But anyway, uh, we are here, and we got a lot to get into. So uh, let's get going. Lance, what's on your mind here today? How you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling good. I'm back home sleeping with my uh, CPAP machine, and uh, my energy levels are good. I sleep better at night, so uh, all is good in the uh, the household of one Lance Storm. You know, you never sent me the uh, your list of topics. Yeah, I did. Maybe it was to a different email, but I tapped on There was a Brian email I sent you. Well, you must have sent it to Brian Pillman or something. No, it wouldn't Can have been you, that. Can uh, you resend it to me? You've got a couple different... Uh, email addresses well, let me look at this all mail let's see there if we it's go. here just send it again yeah nothing bro mm. nothing bro well but... i can start with the first one since you hyped it on uh wrestling observer Live. yes tell us about this stealing uh... a page out of tony khan's book and just uh posting lance an has got a big announcement <laughs> hardly but uh on wrestling observer live uh Brian and Semp were discussing the Iron Claw movie. Yeah. And mentioned that the guy playing Ric Flair, who nobody's ever heard of, it seems, um, uh, it was producer Dom, I think, ran down his list of credits. And it turns out he and I have something in common. Yes, you do. He was in the television series Joe Pickett, which I think was an Amazon or is an Amazon Prime series. And I, too was a part of the Joe Pickett series. Wow. I did some stunt acting where I didn't actually have lines, but I was a visible character in the show. Uh, and I also did uh, a stunt double bit, which uh, I, it started, it was just a stunt double bit. Um, there's a stunt coordinator here in Alberta that uh, is a wrestling fan, knows me, and was pretty much behind all of the gigs I get. And I guess I was... Uh, the right hairstyle, the right size to uh, double this guy. They had to put a fake beard on me. Oh, wait, what? Oh, that guy. I thought you were talking about the guy that played Ric Flair. No. Okay. Because so I was the, like, you the, look nothing like him, and he looks nothing like Ric Flair. No, but the stunt double gig I had in Joe I Pickett, I, uh, I had a fake beard. But on set, several people thought I was the real guy, so the makeup people did wow. a hell of a job. Wow. Wow. Uh, but yeah, then I got a call back to to do an actual uh, scene as a stunt actor. I was a uh, a cop in a bit of a riot, actually. And you will never guess who it was that I was beating up in this riot. I would bet it was, uh, um, I don't know. It blew my mind. Do you remember Mike Lazansky? Oh, yeah. Do you remember his brother, Chris Lazansky? <laughs> I don't remember Chris Lazansky. He wrestled briefly in ECW. Um, that was I remember run... Chris Lazansky now that you mention ECW. Yes. Well, he uh, did a lot of uh, stunt work and apparently was in and out of the stunt business for a while. And lo and behold, he showed up on set. And I was like, oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. I'm immediately texting like Jericho and Don with like, you won't believe who I'm doing a scene with. Wow. Yeah. He was, um, when Mike came to ECW, because Mike was. Um, I think he, Mike, I think Mike was one of the uh, the guys that uh, that pantsed me in that battle royal. I could be. I think it was Mike Lazansky, Luther. Um, Paul. Paul, obviously. And there might have been, there might have been a fourth guy. Was Lazansky Abaddon? I can't fathom there, it. There, no. there was definitely a member of that group named Abaddon. I don't think. I don't Mike. think that was Lazansky. I, I don't think Mike ever wrestled as anything other than Mike Lazansky. Okay. Other than I was just getting to when he came to ECW. Well, my point was there was an Abaddon in that crew, and I'm pretty sure that might might be where the Abaddon main name came from in AEW. Now, possibly. 
could be. We'd have to ask Len. I'll have to take a look, yeah. But um, when Mike came to ECW, Mike was as bad as Hogan with using the term brother. Everyone was brother. He called my house once and was referring to my – and my wife answered, and he called her brother the whole time. But when Mike came, he was obviously from Calgary, and since I – pretty much my gimmick was being from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, they had to change where he was from. And they started on house shows just introducing Mike as brother from Brotherville. So when Chris came in and did a tag match or two with Mike, they actually announced him as brother's brother from Brotherville, and they wrestled. But yeah, wow. he was in the uh, Joe Pickett thing, and I had not seen him in forever. I wouldn't have recognized him if his name wasn't on the call sheet. Because I look in the show, I'm like, Chris Lazansky. I'm like, no way. And sure as shit, he showed up. And uh, there he was. So, yeah, I was a part of Joe Pickett, which uh, apparently featured the same guy. It was actually shot um, just south of here, um, Okotoks and DeWinton area, because a guy from my high school, Sean Black, shout out, um, manages a hotel in Okotoks, and they shot uh, much of the film there, so... There's my big tie-in to the Iron Claw movie. Wow. Maybe you could have been Ric Flair. Wow. I can't think of anyone I would uh, <laughs> less fit. than I could have played Lance Von Erich. Oh, you should have been Lance Von Erich, and then MGF could have been Ric Flair. Uh, I would say Rick, uh, MGF would be a much better casting choice than me to play Ric Flair. Yes, yes. Well, what do you think about uh, Impact rebranding back to TNA? Can you believe it? I was shocked when I found out. They did a hell of a job kayfabing it. Um, I would think most of our roster, or at least a large portion of them, didn't know uh, that video was going to play at the end of the show. Um, I was I found out during during the show. I think it was during the show when I found out. Um, so yeah, um, I think um, I think Dave's take on it was probably the best that nostalgia is a powerful force and people tend to remember the good over the bad. And I know I saw an interview with, with uh, Scott and he he's right in that people still chant it. Um, three letters to chant are a popular thing and impact wrestling doesn't really um, play into that. I think in the grand scheme of things, a name change on its own probably doesn't amount to anything. But I believe there are other changes coming in the new year as far as I know we've got some better venues and um, some studio upgrades and stuff. So I, I think it's a case of let's get some buzz and some notoriety while we're making some other changes and see if uh, we can make some differences. But I do think that the thing that amazes me the most is I've come to the determination that the Brian Vinny show is the center of the universe, that we decide or I've you guys that many decided, times unfortunately it's it's crazy that brian and Vinny show decides to go back and do the retro nwa tna shows and in 2024 both the nwa and tna will be back on television you know both this this them. one is pretty weird that we went back to review tna and then tna returned but uh, it, it it's much, much, much weirder when we just do the show and something absolutely bizarre happens 20 or 21 years later. Like, like when CM Punk Yeah, when CM debuted, Punk, you know, we... CM Punk got fired and then like the next week he shows up on TNA. <laughs> like, what? How is this possible? And this used to happen all the time, you know, when we were doing the, the retro shows. It'd be like, we'd, we'd just be talking about something or something or whatever. And then like 21 years later, 19 years later, something totally bizarre would happen. And, you know, I just sit there thinking, I, you know, maybe I do live in a simulation because this is just like, it's too weird that it happens so often. But yes, TNA is back and we're watching the be. wrong one. The current one is certainly a lot better. I was actually talking with Craig yesterday or today. Um... Because everyone is, you know, was a buzz and, and putting over the Will Ospreay, Mike Bailey match from Bound for Glory. And actually the Bound for Glory pay-per-view on a whole was fantastic. But yeah, Will and, and, and Mike was fantastic. 
And I contend, and perhaps it's more my flavor of ice cream, but I think the Josh Alexander Will Osprey that will air in two weeks um, is probably or might be even better. And again, it'll depend on your taste. I'm sure some will think the speedball match was better and others will think the Josh was. And I just joked with Craig that the uh, the Josh match with Will Ospreay will definitely be better than the tournament in this NWA TNA show from 21 years ago. And realistically, it's probably better than everything combined on any of the shows we've watched thus far. Because uh, the Asylum years are not uh, the nostalgia, fond memories of TNA. Um, well, there certainly are lots of fond memories from the TNA days and some really good um the weekly uh, asylum years are mostly bad yeah you know they are but uh, i have to say that as much as they largely absolutely totally completely suck there are things about them that you can be nostalgic about particularly this week you've got that uh, amazing red match with aj which was awesome and that's it was a it. great match and uh, you know i didn't even mind the well i, I minded because of the length but I, I, it wasn't like Jerry Lynn and Sonny Siaki as a match made me angry. No. I mean, the, the fact that it never ended made me angry. And and even, you know, I said, and you disagreed, I I have fond memories of, of Brian Christopher the last couple of weeks because he's such a ridiculous clown. And, you know, the thing with clowns in wrestling is, you know, we were talking about the Halloween Havoc show. And Mr. Stone was going to uh, fight for uh, his friend, Von Wagner, who was injured so badly he had to relearn how to walk. And, you know, people were saying, he should, he should, it's Halloween, he should dress as Robbie E. And I was like, no, absolutely not. Like, this is a serious thing. Like, keep the serious stuff with the serious stuff. But, like, this TNA show is so bad. The Brent Christopher going out there every week and making a mockery of this show and just being a total over-the-top clown. You are such a hypocrite. I'm fine with that. This but show he's doing sucks. It, he's doing it during a serious... It's not a serious angle. angle. It's not a... Like, they're making him do something stupid. He knows it's stupid. We know it's stupid. It's not really supposed to be serious. It's just stupid. And he's just being stupid. I'm fine with this. It's stupid. That's my biggest take on the jumping ahead to the retro show. And there's a couple things I want to touch on from last week because I didn't get a chance. But... The last time we did a show, I said, I realize it's Groundhog Day. But the other thing that really drove home to me the last two weeks, nobody on this show gives a fuck or cares. Like, I can't believe anyone on this show is even trying. Well, AJ and Red. Sure. Okay. Yes. Yes. But the bulk of the, like, again, whoever's writing the show, either doesn't care or is completely stupid and the latter is probably I go for the latter, a yeah. fair option here yes but like last week there was an opening five way and to make it dumber three of the five are on one team like they're the sats is like it see it feels unbalanced but it's like did nobody even bother trying to explain what the match was to Tanay and west like mike Tanay's out here explaining it's like lucha if someone rolls out of the ring, you can just get in. You don't have to tag. And I'm like, there's no fucking teams. And Mike's going on and on about it's Lucha. You know, tags aren't aren't required, but saves are optional or saves are allowed. And I'm like, it's an elimination match. Why the fuck would anyone make a save? And halfway through the match, Don's like, explain this tags to me again. It's like, oh, it's in Lucha. If the guy rolls out of the ring, he's not required to tag. I'm like. There was no tags in this match. There was no teams in this match. Did no one bother to explain what the match was to Mike Tanay? And the five guys in the match, God bless them, they're out here doing moves, but did no one care enough to connect the dots and go, it's an elimination match, making saves would be fucking stupid? And everybody's out there making saves. At one point, one of the um, SAT, the duo, not Red, although he is part of the SATs. He's the only one of the team that has SAT on his tights half the time. But one of the, whatever the duo is of the SATs, is making a pin to eliminate someone else, and his partner slash brother 
breaks up the pin. And I'm like, okay, you guys are stupid. No one in this match gave a shit to even consider the rules. And it's like, why am I as a fan going to care about any of this shit when clearly the booker didn't care enough to explain it? Mike didn't understand it. The people in the match didn't bother to pay attention to the rules or, which is also possible, that the rules were changed halfway through the day and they forgot. I would say that would probably be the most likely scenario. Like, it's just terrible. You know what might have happened, just because I've watched this show a lot? It's possible it was supposed to be just a five-way or whatever, and whoever got the first pin won. But then later in the afternoon, they found out that a bunch of people weren't going to be there because they weren't getting paid a lot. And they had to stretch it out by making it an elimination match. That possible? It's possible because it does feel like there's always segments on these shows that it's like, what was the point of this other than to eat up minutes? Sure. But, and, and like, as someone who, you know, has uh, my, my coworkers in, in Impact like to say, my cyborg brain, like, on last week's show again, there's like the AMW versus the Hot Shots. And this is where I just turn my brain off because I'm like, no, you're just dumb. The match opens up, and every match on that show opened up with, you know, brawling on the floor. But AMW is bouncing these guys' faces off the guardrails, off the posts, off the steps, off the desk, beating the living shit out of them. They roll into the ring, and the cutoff spot is they reverse the whip, and the guy on the outside trips Chris Harris, and he takes a face bump in the ring. Yes. That was the difference maker. Something that was like one one hundredth of the abuse the other guys just took and are fine now. Like it's it's like opening up with pile drivers and the cutoffs and arm drag. It's like, does nobody care? Does nobody think? It's just like, oh my God. Then to continue the no one seems to care. BG James and Jer and uh, Brian Lawler, your favorite spot where he just jumps from the turnbuckle <laughs> and crotches himself yes. on the top rope. Yes. The finish is he crotches himself on the top rope and gets pinned. Yes. Almost the opening spot of the match, BG crotches him on the guardrail and starts bouncing him balls first on the steel guardrail. Well, exactly, Lance. He worked the balls, and so later the balls were damaged enough that no. one crotching on the top rope was enough to finish the man. No, it's yes. someone who doesn't put enough thought into something because they don't care. And there's more of it Well, I'm later. not going to argue that people don't care. I will not argue that, especially Brian they, Christopher. He clearly does not care. And the, No, he's just out there fucking around but then kurt hennig versus the truth the angle to set up that match was a ball shot there was another match where there was another ball shot in it the finish to the match before them is a ball shot and then just randomly in this match there's like three ball shots one of which is just kurt punting this guy between the balls with the ref watching him i'm like is there not a producer? Is there not a booker? Is there not a wrestler that gives a fuck enough to pay attention so that something on the show means something? Like, it's just, why? Like, you've got five ball shots on the show, three of them are finishes, and this guy's just right in front of the ref. It's it's the standard, um, you know, Jeff Jarrett does it in all his matches. He brawls on the floor, hits guys with chairs left and right. And then does a ref bump 10 minutes later in the match to bring a chair in and thinks he's going to get heat. It's like, does nobody care? And that brings us to this week. At least you did rant. But I, I've, I've got to say, you know, you you and was it you and Vinny? I think you and Vinny were, were the ones that thought the Cash Mamaluke match was OK. But I said it was all right. It was just. Moves being done for no reason whatsoever with no transition. Nothing was like the big stuff isn't sold more than anything else. The pace of the match doesn't change depending on like uh, Mamaluk just about killed kid, kid cash with a backdrop driver. And then like they just both stand up and start trading blows. It's like it doesn't mean anything. It's like it's just a random display of moves for no rhyme or reason, and then one of them's the finish. It's just, I don't know, it's bad. But the 
the the world title match here, Truth and Scott Hall. This had the uh, is this the let me just check my notes here. Oh yeah, this this show where <laughs> Truth just comes out and starts cutting a promo that he's heard all the rumors that Jeff Jarrett is the um, masked guy, Mr. Like, Wrestling Three. Yeah, but it's just like, what? When did this happen? Like, there's three or four promos on the show where they just talk about it's like, oh, I've heard all the talk about Jeff Jarrett's the mask guy. And I'm like, well, we haven't. No one else. Ha like, it, it's almost like Vince Russo, you know, and again, it might not be him, got this idea. And then just this week, it's like, well, let's have everybody think it's Jeff Jarrett. And it's like, well, are we going to build to that? Like, no, just have everybody say they think it's Jeff Jarrett now because they want to do something in that regard. And, and Truth's out here talking about backroom politics. And they're like, what? And then, of course, Truth, <laughs> in a, is this before or after he fucked up the name of the town in WWE? Uh, this would be, I think he did that his second run. So I think that was in the uh, mid-2000s. Because he did it in this one where he screwed up Scott Hall's catchphrase. Yeah, well, yes, he did. <laughs> Don't bring Don't, it. Don't sing Don't it. Don't sing it, bring it. Yes. Yes, he screwed that up. But it was just... <sighs> like, God bless Don West. Um, I really liked him in the main. I thought his enthusiasm was great. But he actually, in this match, and this is where his salesman stuff often, he will claim things that are in no way, shape, or form true. And he puts over that he doesn't think Scott Hall has ever, did he say seen or faced anyone as fast as our truth Fast and acrobatic as our truth And I'm like, his best friend on this show is 123Kid. Yes. Who to not only fair, did he face, but he's his best friend, and X Pac is faster and more agile than our truth. To be fair, he did he did about a minute later say, uh, "I don't think he's ever seen anyone with this kind of speed of late." He, he did add an "of late." He, so he didn't watch X Pac's match last week or AJ's match last. No, week? he he hasn't he hasn't faced anyone. Ah, is what he was saying. Okay. So then that would be true. Yes. Yeah, and then again, just a crap finish where a guy gets in the ring and starts fighting with the dude and not a DQ, and then the match was over. It's like, what? And then the three-way title match, like you mentioned, it's like America's Most Wanted beat both these teams before, and now they're just facing both of them, which leads to it being a handicap. But this is where the announcers are outright burying AMW for being stupid. And then they're also talking about how the, you know, the AMW are, you know, don't get the respect they deserve. And it's like, what? They're the undefeated babyface tag team. Why are you telling everybody they don't have respect? That's why they agreed to this match. They're dumb about. And it's like, they're just burying them. And I don't understand why that would be the story to tell. And this is another classic example of like, does no one bother to decide what the rules are like at one point it's just four on two no tags and then at one point they settle down and start doing tags then they stop doing tags and it's like why is there no one as far as creative control or anything that's just like can we at least decide what the rules are? Well, because you see, that was next. how is supposed to care you see, when you have next. no idea what they're doing? When Bob Armstrong came out and he made a whole bunch of rules... Oh, my God. This was a good one. See, pro, well, you, you mentioned it, and it's so true. It's like he comes out and starts talking about how we're sick and tired of these, you know, champions, you know, intentionally getting themselves counted out or disqualified, which I contend has not happened. He created a fake problem to well, come that's up with true. a solution. That's true. And again, I assume it's a case of Russo has decided... Or, again, they have someone who's not willing to do a job, which there seems to be a lot on this show because they have terrible finishes. That They've decided that there's a title match that need, we need to change a title without pinning somebody. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have to do a DQ or a count out to switch a title because either someone won't do a job or Russo thinks it'll be good heat. So they've just claimed that there's been people taking a cheap way out. 
And this is what drove me crazy, too, because Bob's supposed to be a baby face. He's like, he's saying it's like we can't have these bullshit, shitty DQ or count out finishes to save a title. The fans deserve their money. So we're going to solve this problem of bullshit. We're going to change the rule and allow a title to change hands on a DQ or count out. Now, it was weird because he specifically said, and I don't think it, it's just, if the champion chooses to get disqualified or counted out, he didn't actually say the title will change hands on a count out or a DQ. He intimated that it was more a case of if you did it on purpose to save your title, you're going to lose your title. Yes. If if somebody runs in and attacks the champion, if someone runs in and attacks a challenger, but the champion doesn't want them to do it, then he shouldn't lose the title. But if you just grab well, we a don't chair know if that's, and hit somebody... We don't know if that's true or not. No, we, we don't, don't know anything. But then the other thing, and this is where it's just like, can you at least care a little bit? So he, Babyface Bob decides that we need an enforcer referee. So Heavy D, Don Harris, is going to be the referee of this tournament so we don't have any bullshit. And the very first match of the tournament is Ron Harris versus BG James with Big Heavy D as the ref. And what are we, two minutes in, maybe three, and Bob already has to run down to fire the guy that he hired yes. to solve the problem? Yes. And I don't know whether no one cared and they just fucked it up or whether Heavy D just fucked it up, but he was stopping everyone from punching the announcers were putting over how he was cutting calling it right down the middle and even the one spot that you mentioned where ron ended up decking bg afterwards it's like don made a legitimate two count bg got up in his face and shoved him bitching about the count that was legit and ron just basically told him no it was a fucking two count and then when BG turned around, Harris decked him. Yes. Ron did. I shouldn't use his last name because there's two Harrises out there. And it's like, Don did nothing wrong other than work the front of the ring so he's in front of the hard Thank you for being on my side here. It's like, was this supposed to be a Bob Armstrong, BG James heel turn? No. <laughs> because it's like, Don did nothing wrong. And it's like, even if you were going to do this, could you not flip-flop some of these, like, put the Jerry Lynn tournament match on first so at least we don't have, actually, I think that had a foot on the rope, so they probably didn't want Don Harris to miss something. But it's like the babyface is putting, uh, uh, Bob Armstrong is babyface GM, putting his foot down lasted two minutes before he had to undo what he did to solve the problem. And then just the, irony of having your babyface commissioner say you people aren't getting your money's worth with these bullshit finishes we need to give you your money's worth and then the first two matches in the tournament are the worst bullshit finishes they've had in 18 weeks yeah they I, it's just mind-blowingly terrible and the only thing i can think of that all of this shit was done because bg needed to ex advance and they didn't either they didn't want to have ron harris do a job or harris wouldn't do a clean job so they had to come up with can you imagine of, either scenario my god it could be both but it's like so they create this ridiculous distracting bullshit so nobody remembers how bg won or why and it was just like it was so terrible and then again mm. the the bait and switch on uh Mortimer Plumtree and that's something too that you you certainly wouldn't be upset as a general rule not getting a Mortimer Plumtree match but part of the appeal of this match that you promoted and cut an angle for was the prospect of Mortimer Plumtree getting his ass handed to him and they took it away and they just brought out um Bruce and just had a squash match on poor Jorge and abuse. It's just, it's just bad. And then like Kurt Angle, 
the Kurt Angle. Kurt Hennig. The one thing I thought was funny, and everyone, you all had different things. When they're showing him getting bandaged up, the fact that, like, his hair's down over his face, and it's like they're just bandaging the hair and the blood and everything to his head. It's like not even trying to find where the wound is. Clear, cleaning the wound and bandage it up. It's just like, nope, we have to make him look like a zombie as much as possible. And was this, I assume, just a case of Kurt didn't want to do another job? I would presume so. Because he did sort of two for truth the last two weeks. And it's like, is this supposed to make me want to watch the rest of the tournament? We got the fiasco with Bob and Ron and Don in the first match. And this one, apparently a near comatose man with blood on his head can have Jeff Jarrett waffle him with a chair and then just pin him and beat him. And it's just like, what? It's just so bad. And Jerry and Sonny cut terrible promos to hype up their match. It was just like, oh, and like we have to have attacks after every match. It's like a uh, sunny one with what? Just the feet on the ropes. Yeah. Cause they, yes. he tried to cheat with a chair, but Jerry Van Daminated him. And then Jerry tried to dump him on the chair, but Sonny did him. And then it's like feet on the ropes. And it's like, did we need a ref bump in the two chair shots or could we have done a relatively clean finish? But either way, it's like Sonny pinned him with his feet on the ropes. And apparently this makes Jerry so mad that he has to beat this man to death in anger after the match. And it, it just doesn't seem to make anything mean anything. And then again, I don't even want to get into the... Is X, did, it, did X-Pac sexually assault her or is she lying and conniving and actually enjoying making out with X-Pac and is kayfabing Brian and Brian is a victim. And this is classic Russo. It's like, how are we supposed to, what are we supposed to feel about these three people? Like, is Brian Lawler an abusive boyfriend and a fucking asshole we should hate? Because that's how this angle started. But now he's a doting, legitimate, in love with this woman and... X-Pac is making out with his girlfriend in front of him being a dickhead. The girlfriend is claiming it's against her will, but the when they kissed at the end and she's sort of staring off into space, not kissing him back, it's like, okay, if she's in a manipulative bitch that's actually banging X-Pac while stringing along her boyfriend Jerry or Brian Lawler, then she is a heel, and Brian Lawler, the formerly abusive boyfriend, is a babyface. X-Pac, I believe, is a babyface. I think it's supposed to be that X-Pac is a babyface, Brian Lawler is a jerk, and she is screwing Brian Lawler figuratively by literally screwing X-Pac to get revenge on this jerk. That's what I believe is happening here. But I don't know. Well, that sounds right in that the, the real villain of everything is the woman, so it's classic. Well, the villain is Russo. still Lawler. Like, she's, she is now screwing him figuratively because he was being a jerk to her, you see. Ah. Yes. Okay. Thank God we got the main event of this show. AJ Styles versus a, he appears to be 14, but I think he's 18. Amazing Red. He is 18, yeah. Was fucking amazing. This match was the only match on the show that had some transitions, some pacing, some things getting excited. Don West was fucking fantastic. He was so great in this match. Because he... Amazing Red is a fantastic underdog babyface. Don West is a fantastic, excitable, enthusiastic fan that wants to see Red achieve. And it was incredible. I don't think you needed the Mortimer pull the foot thing, but I can see where it's like, all right, he's out there. He's a heel. We've got a story to tell. Let's keep Mortimer involved. But the finish was clean enough that I could consider it a clean finish. And at least somebody, unless they just got lucky because they, you know, a stopped clock is right twice a day. 
someone finally had the realization that maybe selling the next show might be easier if we end the show with a good match and a clean finish where fans can actually f- be happy at the end Bro, of the show. Bro, this had to be a, a total coincidence. There's no way this was by design. It was just the way it worked out. They had a great match, and then they had him do his deal. But I can't believe Russo was like, hey, let's do a great match at the end and then sell it. Well, no, next week. Because if there's no great match followed by the hard sell, it was a broken clock. Because it certainly helps Don West out. Sure. Because Although it doesn't he, really if you've seen him do his hard sell. No. I mean, but he it, could watch it, a horrible show and still do a good hard sell. Well, yes, but it's easier to buy the sell. Well, sure. When he's not so it's easier hyping, for us. Tune in to see this problem resolved after you just got three straight shit finishes that didn't resolve any problems, where this was a <laughs> relatively clean win by a champion. Now, I do want to bring up, because it seems to have been forgotten, surprise, surprise, but remember when Bob Armstrong said that the ladder match is going to be for the title because Jerry was hurt, but you will get a title shot as soon as you're healthy? Yeah. Well, Jerry's wrestled two or three times since then and apparently is not getting an X Division title this shot This shit's at all. hard to remember, Lance. Come on. What do you yeah. expect a guy to remember what happened two weeks ago when he writes the show? Come on. Yeah, it's... It's it, on that topic. It's a funny story. If you remember back in the 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 um, the nostalgia days of TNA, what I was on more than one occasion critical of the product. There was a. I guess I wrote a commentary or did a show with you, perhaps, and maybe you're a cohort in this, where I suggested, and I I hope looked, so. Looking at these uh, asylum shows, I would say it works good here. I suggested that they take a logical wrestling person. And I think I used, you know, uh, uh, Scott Demore or Terry Taylor. And like, don't have them sit in the production meeting. Don't have them be part of creative. But when you are done writing the show, give them the f- script format sheet, whatever you want to call it, and have them read through the show. And I think I said, if they have to ask why, you know, more than twice on the show, you have to rewrite it. Because you should be able to watch a show and not be fucking confused. And I have been told since, because I actually work for Scott Demore now, that back in the day, me suggesting he and Terry Taylor for this role got he and Terry Taylor a lot of heat from the creative team. Why? <laughs> because I guess me, I was probably uh, an enemy of the state, and I named them as perhaps good people to be involved. Oh, man, wow. Although I wouldn't be surprised if they were also ones that pointed out things that didn't make sense. So they probably uh, thought he was putting me up to it. But uh, yeah, it's just the show is no one seems to care enough to. And then this is something that, you know, I know we in impact do. And I know in uh, WWE when I was there as a producer, they do, or at least try to, it's like, there is a point where you try to, go back once everyone's putting their match together. In WWE, Johnny Ace was the head of the producers, and he had a clipboard, and when you got your match put together and shit, you had to go to Johnny and go, hey, you know, we're doing two dives, we're doing a ball shot, we're doing a thing into the steps, anything that was sort of, you know, out of the ordinary. And he would keep track of it because if one of the other producers had already got to him and they'd go, yeah, we're doing a spot into the stairs. We're doing a ball shot. We're doing the shoulder through the post into the, uh, through the turnbuckles into the post. It's like Johnny would have that written down and go, yeah, Lance, um, that's happening already on the show. Don't do that. And it's like, these shows need that. And it's like, we have a ball shot finish on the show. There should be a big, no ball shots somewhere you know backstage for everybody so they know they don't um i think you're aware of it i think it's been mentioned before but back when i was in wwe as a as a talent whenever rick flair was on the show there would be a big sign in gorilla by the curtain to go through that would be no chops until after whatever segment flair was in sure and it's like 
which again, I agree with, you know, there's probably some people that are like, Oh, it's like, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. People are going to woo for flares chops anyway, but just a degree of quality tr- control can go a long way. All right. Before we go today, you got uh, more to talk about with your career. Did we do uh 2009? Um, we did part of it, but we didn't do the Ring of Honor stuff. We just did up to the end of whatever it was before this. All right, let's do the. Uh, Ring I think of we Honor did the stuff. end of the SWA kid. But yeah, uh, 2009 was my. Was this my first? No, uh, but no, because Danielson was my first Ring of Honor. This was my return to Ring of Honor. Um, I did two shots in Toronto, uh, a tag, me and Kevin Steen, the, the now Kevin Owens against Davy Richards and Chris Hero. And then the following night, I did a single with Hero. And the story behind this, um, when I left WB, Gabe Sapolsky used to, you know, he asked if I'd be willing to, but he said he'd send me DVDs if I'd watch them and give them feedback on camera, production, talent, wrestling, anything. So I started doing that. So I had a shitload of Ring of Honor. Oops, as I knocked the headphones off my ears. The DVDs, and I was giving talent feedback. And some talent would get back to me and be very grateful other talent wouldn't so i was you know coaching the email stuff and when they offered me this match the original match they offered me was against jimmy jacobs and tyler black and i had suggested something with hero because hero was one of the guys that took my feedback to heart and i communicated with a lot and i thought made a lot of uh, improvements and so forth um because he was doing a lot of the uh you know where he had just what i would consider sort of some comedy haha and just jumping around stuff and i thought he could be a, a a serious more heavy player and i thought he did a hell of a job so um i suggested doing something with hero instead so cornet who was booking at the time suggested um if i put hero over in the tag match then he'd have hero beat me the following night in the single or have me beat him the following night in the single and I said, OK, but I demanded he switch that, that I'll beat him in the tag and put Hero over in the single because it'll accomplish more for Chris Hero if he beats me in the single and beats me the last night and I'll go out on my back because it's what I, you know, I always thought you should do. So I did the tag with me and Steen against uh, Richards and Hero, which was a lot of fun. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize I wrestled Davey Richards, but I did. Um, and then we did the, the hero match the next night, which was really good. And the only, the hero match was one that I actually, I thought it played well into the story watching it back, but I rolled my ankle like four weeks out before the match. So it's like my cardio was not where I wanted it to be. So I, I struggled a bit cardio wise getting through the single with hero, but I, I thought it came off, um, well as a story. Um, so it was really good. And then also too, and this is just a uh, suggestion to people, cause I've always been an advocate of going out on your back and helping them. I remember after I switched the finish to hero winning the second night, Cornette again offered that, okay, I'll put hero over, but then he can go to beat me up after the match and I can come back with a super kick and, you know, leave with my head held high and a, a happy moment. And I'm like, I'm putting the dude over. Why don't we just get the dude over? I'll just stay down. And I I think he left, and then I eventually got to my feet and cut a promo. But uh, um, I didn't get back up on him. So that was a lot of fun. And and even that, I was originally booked for a signing. And then they got Bret Hart in to sign. And then I remember sort of them trying to politely say that we've got Bret signing. You signing's not worth the money anymore. Uh, you got to do more if you want to be on the show. So that's when I uh, agreed to work. But it was funny because as soon as he mentioned, I'm like, well, if you've got Brett at an autograph signing, I'm not going to add anything. So, uh, But me working in the ring hopefully added something. And uh, I was quite happy with both matches. They were a lot of fun. And uh, let's see, where are we moving to next? I need you to have a lot of time for 2010. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. That's a big one we got to talk about, Lance. That'll 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 encourage me to be on the show next week. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a big match in 2010. Yes, it really was, actually. Some mask guy against some jobber. Yeah, you weren't a jobber, Lance. So listen, <laughs> let's uh, let's get some plugs in for uh, all your stuff there, Lance. All righty. Um, this week, Impact uh, Access TV, Thursdays, 8 Eastern, Fight Network in Canada. Um, the show is um, footage and stuff from the UK because they're over there. I think they're still over there now. I'm not sure. 
or they were just gotten back. But yeah, they were from the UK. So it's a really fun show. I'm actually just because, um, again, I've mentioned before, I watch it ahead of time. And it's a lot of fun for me uh, because usually when I watch the weekly impact show, I've already been to the production meeting, been there when the matches were taped. So they're not nearly as much fun to watch. But getting to watch it without any prior knowledge to what was going on is making it a really fantastic show. So if you want to check out Impact Wrestling Thursday's Access TV in the U.S., Fight Network in Canada this week's a great show. And as I mentioned, the uh, Will Ospreay-Josh Alexander match is on the horizon, and it's one you're not going to want to miss. So Impact Wrestling, soon to be TNA. Everyone says it's TNA now, but I think it's officially January. January, yeah. And then also to the scripted uh, podcast series Escaping Denver that I'm a part of. There's actually quite a few, if, especially if you go back to the beginning. You can binge season one and two, and three is dropping weekly currently. There are a lot of wrestling cameos. And uh, since it's not video and it's audio, it's fun to listen and try to see if you can spot and name all of the pro wrestlers that are um, characters in the series. Well, we got a couple of minutes, so we got some questions here from the uh, chat. We're live on YouTube. Every uh, Wednesday, by the way, for the Lance Show, if you are a fan of Lance, video.f4wonline.com. But you have to watch live. All the replays and everything are members only. But uh, 40VR here says, Lance, how come you and Mike Awesome didn't get an entrance in Invasion 2001? The show starts with you both in the ring. I heard the set was unfinished as the show began. Is that true? No idea. If you'd have asked me, I'd have told you we got an entrance. I had no idea that entrance was dark. All right. Or is it possible, because I contend we had an entrance, is it possible that there was some uh, signage that was an issue or something and they just edited it off the network? Uh, it's possible. Hmm. possible. I have no idea, though. All righty. This person here says where did this one go dang it all right which would you feel would be more beneficial john asks so if you were a wrestler which would you prefer i am a wrestler if the uh you're retired i'm talking if you're a wrestler now signed to wwe would you prefer if they got rid of the ability to tack on time for injuries or the no compete after you were released which would you prefer they got rid of? Which is more beneficial? Well, I think them not being able to tack time on for injury, because which I, I think is weird. It's like if you sign a two-year deal, the fact that you'd have to stay there for three feels odd to me. And and like the the no compete, it's like you get paid. So it's like even if there was no, no compete, which in a lot of cases there really isn't. It's like if my contract is up December 31st this year and I'm not re-signing and WWE doesn't want me jumping from WWE's TV to AEW TV, they can just leave me off television November and December and they essentially get a two-month no compete it's like it really doesn't change anything. They can shelve you so you're inactive and can't jump one to the other regardless of the concept of a no-compete. So to me, the no-compete thing doesn't matter at all, where the potential of, especially if you signed a five-year deal and with the injury right now, it's like there's guys that might have been injured for two of those years and all of a sudden, it's a seven-year deal. It's like, holy shit. That really changes things, especially if you're getting older and you go like, okay, I'll just sign a five-year deal. That way, I'll still have a couple good years that I can you know, leverage for. And your five-year deal turns into a seven. So I think the uh, tacking time on for injury is the more uh, limiting of the two. This person here says, have you heard uh, John Moxley's idea about what to do with concussions? And what do you think? Um, I remember hearing it and I was, I know there was an issue he, I had he with He basically it. said that, you know, you should have a doctor, oh, right. a wrestler in the back watching and they are keeping an eye on things. And if they make the call, it's over. Cause his point is like, yes, you have a doctor at ringside, but he's sitting in a certain area 
And if you fly off the top and you get concussed on the opposite side of the ring, he doesn't know what happened. He didn't see it. Maybe he doesn't make the right call. So yeah, the, the one thing that he said that I th- and again, maybe just Dave re- read it wrong, I thought was dumb was that the wrestler and doctor watching weren't supposed to know the finish or anything about the match. And to me, that's a big difference maker because there was a match. I don't say which one because I don't even remember. And, and But I was agenting a match, and I think it was Mike Bailey. But they did a kick exchange, and I remember when they were putting it together, Bailey was going to dead sell it like he was out and the guy was struggling to pick him up and he was going to look really fucked up and it was going to lead into a kick out of nowhere and and a good reaction. And during the match, I'm on headset. And when he's doing this sell, others on headset were like, is he okay? Do we need to stop this? Is he all right? Is anybody knowing? It's like, you know, they're trying to get the ref to check on everything else. And I just chime in because I'm on headset. It's like, no, this is planned. He's doing this on purpose. And everybody else relax and he hits the kick. And I could tell he wasn't fucked up because I knew that was the exact moment he was planning on selling it that way. And when the next thing he did was exactly what he had planned to do, I knew he wasn't messed up. But had I not known that that was his plan, there's a possibility they would have stopped the match and fucked up everything. Well, yeah, it's one of the things, too, because I was I always thought uh, and I've mentioned this before, you know, they've got uh, the dreaded X, which is the symbol that you give to the back when something goes wrong. But, you know, we got to the point where, hey, we're going to do an injury angle and uh, to sell it, we're going to have the referee hold that X up, you know, do something really stupid, pretend the guy's hurt, hold up the X or whatever. But I always thought like, well, what if you do that really stupid fucking thing and the guy actually gets hurt? (laughs) And then you do the big X and everyone in the back is like, ah, it's a plan. Don't worry about it. But he's actually knocked out, which is why I thought there should be like, okay, this this is to the back. But if you're going to do like the injury angle, then you maybe you do it like this, where you go across your chest or whatever. Well, but even so, there's like a real one and a gimmick one. But the the audience doesn't need to know the difference. It's just for like. But to you're the getting back. into Vince Russo work shoot bullshit. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying. Once they did that, that was my thought. Like, same thing. Like, okay, so so they've told you we're gonna do a spot where a guy gets kicked and he acts like he's knocked out. Okay, cool. Well, you do the the spot and you knock him out, and he's dead. And then everyone's like, going, "Is this guy okay?" And, like, the refs come to the, oh, he's not doing all right. And Lance is like, ah, it's a plan. Don't worry about it. That's the issue that you run into, but whether yes, you but mean to you or not. Listening, which, of course, you seldom do. How dare you? That was for Craig. I said he immediately did exactly what the plan was and everything. Well, that yes, of course. On. Sure. If he acted uncharacteristically afterwards, then I could. And I think we mentioned this before, too, and I wish guys would stop doing it. Um. There's occasion now, because people know what happens when you really get knocked out, that guys will do the locked out arm, dead man, yes. you know, you've been knocked unconscious cell. Last night on NXT. It was a little and, bit different, but Dragunov did the uh, lost feeling in his arms gimmick after a DDT. And, you know, the telltale signs, and again, I've been to a few lectures by Chris Nowinski, of the selling, and, you know, he's pointed out in that stupid power slap thing where, you know, the guy will go into whatever, if there's a name for it, but where the guy's arms are straight out, he's laying on his back and his arms are straight out and they're rigid. It's like, that's a huge red flag that this guy has suffered a severe brain injury. And those of us who sell a super kick should not be using that as a sell to try to get extra sympathy out of people because I think that's getting into a place that we we should avoid. But much of what Moxley suggested I do think is a good idea. I just think they should be in on what's happening so they can tell how sharp the guy is um, with how he's remembering things. All right. Well, we are out of time for Real Now, everybody. Check out uh, this show every Wednesday, 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern. We'll probably do more Q&As in the future since we got people watching live and free. So uh, thanks for listening, everybody. That's it. We'll talk to you again after a while. Adios.